جزاك الله خير بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين uh, Thanks very much all for coming uh, to this uh, great uh, second uh, webinar. Uh, I'm not going to probably maybe introduce the topic, but I'll, I'll probably maybe a few words introduce uh, the speaker, Brother uh, Dr. Wajid. Uh, I know Dr. Wajid Akhtar for uh, a good number of years, mashallah. Uh, he's a GP in London. Uh, he's a medical tutor in uh, social media and history of medicine at Sir jo St. George's University. Also, he's the co-founder of the Islamic History Channel. Uh, Dr. Wajid, mashallah, he's the uh, council member and the uh, ex-vice president for BIMA, the British Islamic Medical Association. And he's really uh, been and is still, uh, mashallah, very active in a few projects, and mainly the Life Savers, which is part of the uh, FEMA project. And during uh, the uh, COVID crisis, he's been coordinating uh, between different groups uh, mashallah, uh, uh, he's been uh, uh, running and chairing the uh, uh, COVID response group, uh, arranging all uh, whatever needed uh, uh, in this uh, topic. And he's been part of the executive committee as well of the Muslim Council of Britain, the MCP. And I think I'll probably maybe leave it to uh, Dr. Wajid. He'll probably maybe uh, introduce the topic and uh, we can start, inshallah, We're aiming. Uh, maybe 50, 60 minutes, and then it'll be, inshallah, uh, 10, 15 minutes uh, uh, question answer session. Jazakum Allah khair, akhi. Jazakum Allah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen, wa salatu wa salam, wa ashrafu anbiya wa salin, nabiyana Muhammad, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa salimu wa laytu salimu wa jami'an kathira. And jazakum Allah khair for that very kind introduction, Dr. Sharif. Probably at the top of the CV should say, I work with Dr. Sharif. That's one of my, <laughs> actually one of my good uh, things that I did, alhamdulillah. But uh, I want to start off uh, first with a few ayahs from the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, الَّذِي خَلَقْنِي فَهُوَ يَهْدِينَ وَالَّذِينَ هُوَ يَطْعِمْنِي وَيُسْخِينَ وَإِذَا مَرِدْتُ فَهُوَ يَشْفِينَ It's he who created me and he who guides me. And it is he who feeds me and gives me drink. And when I am ill, it is he who cures me. You know, every hero in Islam didn't come out of the blue. They, didn't, they were not just, you know, born a hero. Somebody made them into a hero. Somebody developed them. Someone trained them. Someone mentored them. Someone taught them. And one of the greatest heroes we have in Islam is Salah al-Din Ayyubi. And his mentor, his tutor, his guide was Nuruddin Zangi. And it's always the case, we know more about the hero than we know about the person who made the hero. So let me tell you a story about Nuruddin Zangi. Nuruddin Zangi, he was well known to be a leader who was a man of principle. He was a man who was not bought by money. He was a man who was not interested in titles. He was a man who was not only deeply religious, but deeply just. And sometimes those two don't go together, unfortunately. So Nur al-Din Zengi was a very special leader for the Muslims. And he was fighting against the Crusaders. And during his battles against the Crusaders, there was one Crusader prince who was very very brave. This crusader prince didn't care about his life. He would go into the front of the battlefield and he would kill many Muslims and he would injure many and he would be he would turn the outcome of the battle by himself because of his bravery. But because he was brave, he also took many chances. And because he took these chances, because he, he took these risks, he was caught by the Muslims. So when the Muslims caught him, straight away the Crusaders, they said, we're going to give you ransom. Here's the ransom, give us our prince back. So one time the Muslims, they took the money and they gave him back. This guy came back again. He was killing, beating the Muslims, winning. Then they caught him again. Again, the Crusaders gave the money. And again, the Muslims gave him, uh, gave him back, took the ransom. But this time, maybe the third time, 
he was again killing. I mean, he didn't. He, he, this guy, he seemed like he was on a mission, right? So he was again at the front of the battlefield. He was again defeating the Muslims. He was again hurting them, killing them. And this time he was caught by Nuruddin's men. He was not caught by some of the others. He was caught by Nuruddin's men. And Nuruddin's men took him to Nuruddin. And, they, uh, and again, the crusaders said, we're going to give you a hundred thousand gold coins because they knew this is Nuruddin's men. They're not going to give him up easily. So they gave a lot of money. Straight away, 100,000 gold coins we're going to give you, give our prince back, ransom him. And Nuruddin's men said, no, 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 no. This is, we're not the same people like the others that you can buy us. We're not sending him back. What, so he can defeat us tomorrow? He can kill us tomorrow? No way. We're going to finish him. We're going to finish him off. You can't, we won't take your money. They went to Nuruddin and they said, "This is they've given us hundred. They want to give us hundred thousand gold coins for him." Nuruddin said, "I don't think this is a good idea." They said, "Yes, exactly. We knew you are the right man. You will do the right thing. You're not going to take the money." Nuruddin said, "But I always do salat al istikhara before I take a big decision, and this is a big decision. So I should do what I always do." Even though I'm, I, I, I am inclined, I agree with you yourselves, we shouldn't take the money, we should finish him off. But I will pray Salat al-Istikhara. He prayed Salat al-Istikhara and his, he came back to his people, he said, uh, I don't know how to tell you this, but when I prayed Salat al-Istikhara, I felt like the answer is we should take the money. Then his army became very upset. What? Take the money? Are you crazy? We're going to take the money so he can kill us tomorrow. We thought you didn't care about the money. Come on. This is ridiculous. No. They started being getting um, uh, disagreeing with him. And when he said, but my istikhara, they became even more disagreeable. And when he said, but I need to listen, they said they became angry at him. They said, what are you, what, what are you, what's wrong with you, Nuruddin? You don't understand? You don't understand what's at stake here? You, you, you want the money? Have you become greedy? He said, okay, okay, let me sleep. Let's sleep in the night, and then in the morning we will make the decision. While everyone went to sleep in the night, Nuruddin quietly went to the gate of the prison, and he told the crusader, he opened it, and he told the crusader prince, I have to follow my istikhara. Like there's no pay, point praying Salat al-Istikhara if I'm not going to, uh, follow the advice given at the end of it. What listen, you know, listen to what I feel at the end of it. So I'm going to let you go free. Quickly leave from here before they find out. Otherwise, they will kill you and me. Yeah. So you go, and I'll take the hundred thousand gold coins. The Crusader Prince left. The next morning, the people saw the open prison. No Crusader Prince. They said he escaped. How did he escape? And they were the alarm was sounded. Nordin said, "Don't, don't." Forget the alarm. I let him go. The army said, what? what? What did you say? He said, I let them go. You you let him go. Yeah, I opened the gate for him and I let him go. Why? He said, because I have to follow my Salat al-Istikhara. And my, uh, the opinion I had from the Salat al-Istikhara, from the prayer, was that we should let him go and take the money. I can't uh, disobey that. They started uh, getting angry at him and just and and even abusing him, until someone came running from the desert, and that person came and he said, "Nuruddin, Nuruddin." Then everyone stopped and said, "What? What's up?" He said, "You know that crusading prince you let go last night? Yeah. He died before he even reached his camp, before he reached his people. He died of natural causes. Maybe he was sick. Maybe he had a heart attack. Nobody knows, but he died before he even reached them." Now everyone is happy. Everyone is celebrating. Ah, oh, mashallah. We got the 100,000 gold coins and he's dead as well. He's gone. So we got the best option, mashallah. You know? Because if we had killed him, we wouldn't have got the 100,000 gold coins. And he was destined to die anyway. We let him go. He died by himself uh, before he reached his people and we got the 100,000 gold coins. Alhamdulillah. Brilliant, brilliant. So they're all now, everything, they, they were happy and they turned to Nuruddin and said, what are we going to do with this money? 100,000 gold coins. Nuruddin said, we, 
What are we going to do with this money? We, we're not going to do anything. You guys didn't believe what I said. You didn't have faith in what we uh, my prayer. You guys didn't believe in it. So none of us are going to touch this money. Instead, I'm going to use this money to open a Bimaristan for the people. And that's what he did. He opened the Bimaristan and Nuri, which to this day is in Damascus. And I was, uh, alhamdulillah, I was lucky enough just a few months before the revolution to go and see it myself. So what is a Bimaristan? Because that's the talk today, right? What is this valuable thing that, you know, Nur al-Din wanted to use the money, a lot of money towards, instead of making himself rich, instead of making his army rich, he said, no, this Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us as a gift, this we're going to make a Bimaristan. What is a Bimaristan? That's what I'm going to tell you about today, inshallah. And this is Bimaristan Nuri in, uh, in Damascus. Bimaristan was a hospital, basically. Bimar means sick. Stan means land or area, place of. So it's a place of the sick. And in big Muslim cities in the old days, Cairo, Baghdad, uh, Damascus, all the big cities, the cities were built around three buildings. The first building was the masjid. The masjid belonged to is the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second building was the palace or the qasr, you know, the, the fortress. And that belonged to the king or the sultan or the khalifa. And the third building was the bimaristan. And that belonged to the people. So these three buildings, right? One that belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one that belongs to the ruler, and one that belongs to the people, were the core, were the nucleus of the cities. Before Muslims bought the Bimaristan into the heart of the city, there was no concept like hospital. If you read different books, of course, every society, if you read Western books, they like to pretend that, you know, hospitals started when in the Greek era, or if you read um, other books, they will say they started in the Christian era. Every, everyone, you know, uh, in Hinduism, they'll say it started in India. Everyone will say it started in their place. But to be honest, if you look at it objectively, it wasn't a hospital what they built. In ancient Greek times, thousand years before Muslims, or in, in, in India, uh, you know, thousands of years before Muslims or ancient Egypt, they never built a hospital. What they built was a building for the sick where the sick people, they are just dumped there. Maybe, maybe there was like a priest or a monk or someone there who looked after them. Not really looking, not really, not really like a cure. Especially this is for people who are like lepers. You know, the people who have leprosy, their skin is falling off because it's very contagious. They will put them in the same building and it will be far away from the town, far away. It would be dirty. It would be uh, malnourished. It would be uh, very uh, disgusting. Nobody would visit. And if you're lucky, you had one or two priests to look after you and you, you live and you die like that. Is You're just there. It's like a, a waiting room for your grave, basically. Because there's no cure. And that's, a, that's before Muslims came around. When Muslims came around, we built it inside the heart of the city and we did something completely different. And this, I'm going to tell you what the Bimaristan was. And of course, this wasn't in every small Muslim city or town, but this was the ideal that they built in the big ones. And they definitely had, you know, in some cities, uh, I remember I reading one uh, travel account, I think it was Ibn Jubair. In Aleppo alone, there was maybe 80. Yeah, probably more. There are more Bimar stands at the time of Ibn Jubair in Aleppo than there are hospitals right now in Aleppo. So the Bimar stand, what was the Bimar stand? Number one, Look at this. Does this look like a, a hospital? Or does it look like a palace? It was a palace. You know, the mosque is built beautifully because it's for Allah. The palace is built beautifully because it's for the Sultan. And the Bimaristan is built beautifully because it's for the people. In fact, in uh, Cairo, when Salah Din took over in Cairo, the Fatimid palace, the big, big palace of the Fatimid Khalifas, he looked at it and he said, I can't 
I cannot justify living here, make this into a Bimaristan, and I will live in a different building. I can't live in this. This is too big, too amazing. It was literally a palace, the Bimaristan. It wasn't like a, a dirty building. And we see hospitals today, they can be small, they can be cramped, smelly. They don't, it's not the kind of place that you look at and you say, wow, beautiful, you know? You, you see, you know, they share on social media, people share pictures of buildings, right? Look, Eiffel Tower, look at the, look at this uh, Big Ben, look at this uh, pyramid. Nobody shares a picture of a hospital. Not once in your life have you seen anyone say, look at this building, beautiful building. You know what it is? It's a hospital. No, never. Why? We don't make hospitals look nice anymore. We make them look scary. If, if, if it's a rich country, it looks clinical. You know? If it's a poor country, it looks dirty, disgusting. It doesn't look nice. In the old, in the Muslims, we're making them like palaces. You want to go to a, yes, you want to go to a palace. You want there, you want to go there. Beautiful material. Look at them. Look at the way it looks. And then, when you arrive in the Bimaristan, the look at what happens when you arrive. You are, your old clothes are taken away, and they are packed. They're not thrown. They are packed, and you are given new clothes. New clothes because you can bring maybe diseases in your old clothes. You're given new, nice clothes, right? Not like in nowadays in the hospital, right? They give you an apron. Your apron is like flying open. You're not sure, oh my God, what, what is being exposed? What is not being exposed? You're losing your dignity. From the minute you walk in, you lose your dignity, isn't it? This is not what happened in Muslim hospitals. You're given extra dignity. You're a poor man. You're treated. You're given nice clothes. No problem. New clothes. And you're given some your own money. Why? Because you might want to buy something. You know, I, you know, I'm hungry. I have for chocolate. I'm here by myself. I'm not for, with my family. I want to buy a chocolate, but I don't have any money in my pocket. What do I do? And that's what happens. What do I do? You just wait for your family, or you don't have anything. No, here's some money. You want to buy something? You can buy something, inshallah. Not only that, you're given your own room. Yeah, not like animals in like big hall, twenty people, thirty people, forty people. Just fill them, fill them, fill them. Your own room. With your own furniture, reading, writing, you know, you are going to be here for a few days. They do this in a hotel, right? Every hotel. Can you imagine in a hotel? Here's a bed, you shut up and you sit there. No, you say, I'm not going to stay at this hotel. In the hospital, bed, bus. You 20 people, you share this toilet. No. You in in Muslim, in the Islamic times, the Bimaristan, this is your room, like a hotel. You're on suite, your, your furniture, you're going to be here, we're going to look after you, and you have to look after yourself. Look at this, this is an image of a Bimarasan. Look, it looks like a hotel, yeah? Air, Airbnb, better than Airbnb, it's your own. Not only that, the men and women, they had their own separation. This is necessary. They cannot be comfortable, right? Men and women are in the same bay, or like next to each other, it's, it, you're not comfortable like this. So they, they were separated. And every day, you get to take a bath. This is the hammam. Now imagine, this is a time where Europe was still debating whether taking a bath was, was uh, religiously acceptable or not. 500 years after this Bimaristan was built, 500 years, no, maybe maybe 1,000 years after this Bimaristan was built, Queen Elizabeth I, they had a big debate about whether the queen should take a bath or should not take a bath, ever. And she decided, she said, she, she said at the end of the debate, I will take a bath once a year, whether I need it or I don't need it, I will take it once a year. That was the decision she took. Queen Isabella of Spain, you know the one, the Reconquista, they kicked out the Muslims, uh, Isabella and Ferdinand. So Isabella, the Queen of Spain, the first uh, Catholic queen after all that time, she only took two baths in her whole life because it was seen as taking a bath, was seen as dirty, was bad. It's a Muslim thing. Don't do it. Every day in the Bimaristan, you take a bath. Every day you are cleaning yourself. And we know this, right? Where does this come from? The Prophet ﷺ said, "An-nizafa nisf al-iman." Cleanliness is half of faith, and cleanliness 
is prevention, it's cure in there, right? Germs are going away. What about the food? What about the food in the Bimaristan? You know, food is important. Food, you know, food is very important. If you think about it, let me ask you a question, right? What's the difference between first class and economy class, any airplane? What's the difference? Can anyone tell me? Do you arrive one hour early if you go by first class? You know, does first class have zero turbulence? The economy class has 100% turbulence? What's the difference? The difference is only two. The, the size of your seat, you have a bigger seat, more space, and the food. That's it. For this, you pay 10 times more the price. And you are happy to pay it. Those who can afford it, they will pay it and they are happy. I will pay 20 times more first class. I don't want to say economy. Why? For the food and the space. Food is very, very important. You know, for the human being, food makes a huge difference. The quality of the food, the type of food to our happiness, right? In a wedding, if they have good food, you remember it. You went and you ate good food. You, you know, you like Ramadan, when you think about Ramadan, when your childhood, you remember the food that your mom made for you. Huh? Food is so important. For the human being, it's a very important thing. It, it has a huge impact on our quality of our uh, any experience. So what about the hospital? Tell me, what's the food like in the hospital today? It is not only, it is not uh, good for most of the hospitals, it is usually unhealthy. <laughs> the food is not nice. There's a website, uh, you should check it out. There's a man, he just goes and he takes the food in the different hospitals all across the world. All across the world, every country. And he asks people to send the pictures. Just send me the pictures of the food you get in the hospital. It's very interesting to see the food that you get. And actually, you know, even in the first world countries, they have really bad food they give in the hospital. Why? It's not, and this is not just for the patients, even for the staff. Ask the junior doctors, what food do you get? Do you get, they give you good food? They should treat you nicely, isn't it? They want you to work hard. They don't want you to finish five o'clock, finish, I walk away. They want you to work harder. They want you to work longer. They want you to give really big, intense effort. Okay, what can you do? I can't give you so much money. We don't have that much money. What can you do? You can give them food, good food. They'll be happier. Believe me, but no. What do you give the junior doctors? What do you give the one who's doing on call day and night? Just whatever, you don't know. We're not giving you any food. You can buy what the patient buys. You can buy a cheese sandwich or a cheese and tomato sandwich, a cheese pickle sandwich to go to hell. We don't care about your food. You don't care about them. So they're becoming unhealthy. They're working 12 hours, so hungry. And then they buy a Coca-Cola. Then they buy just quick burger, why? Because they have not, they have to eat quickly. And then you're saying, why is our staff, they are not healthy? Why are they uh, demotivated? De Don't be surprised. Food is important. And the Muslims, they knew this from early on. Do you know who made the food? Who made the food of the Bimaristan? The same cooks who made the food of the Khalifa. The same cooks, not different ones. The same cooks would make the food of the Khalifa from this, they would get the ingredients from the same garden and they would give the same food. The food that the Khalifa was eating and the food you, you were getting in the Bimaristan would be the same food. Can you imagine? If I'm here in UK and you know I, I, I'm in the hospital, I'm eating the same food King Charles is eating. No chance. No chance. You know, there's no chance. If you get this food every day, breakfast, lunch, dinner, nice food, you know, wraps, shawarma, beef, chicken, vegetables, tasty. Are you, are you gonna feel, you know, unwell? Good food has a very important part to play in good health. <clears throat> what about the doctors? You can see the difference. This is a doctor on the left. This is a doctor from Europe. The doctors from Europe, they wore this big beak thing because they felt that this is a way of protecting them. They would wear these capes and aprons to protect them from the patient. And they would carry the, this bunch of garlic so that the smell of the patient would always be away from them. And 
they would carry this stick. You know why they carry the stick? <clears throat> if the patient came too close, they would hit him with the stick so that he went far away. This is the, a Euro European doctor. On the right is a Muslim doctor at that time. He's dressed in the same clothes. He looks like someone, that, you know, like a sheikh, like a alim, because that's what they were. They were doctors. They were scholars of doc being doctors and surgery. You would be rather treated by this person than that one. That one you will, it will leave you nightmares for weeks. And they had female doctors as well. Female clinicians. From the earliest days, when the time the Prophet ﷺ went to battle, the people who were looking after the patients, the people who were wounded, they were all, they were all the females. And uh, it's our bias that we say they are nurses because they are females, so they are nurses. But not really. They're stitching their wounds. They're doing the work. They're not just uh, assisting someone, right? They weren't as, uh, nurses to a doctor. They were everything. They were the surgeon and the doctor and the nurse and the physio, everything. So for female doctors, female patients were there as well. And the doctor, he would go on a ward round in the morning, every day, or maybe uh, uh, twice a week, they would go around the patients and the senior doctor, this is a, a picture someone drew of a Zahrawi, and he is educating uh, his students in Medina al Zahra. That's why he's a Zahrawi. He was in Medina al Zahra in, uh, in and Andalus about um, how to break stones because he was uh, one of the pioneers of this. And amongst hundred one other things, we should we need to do the whole thing just on the Zahrawi. And uh, Dr. Sharif, I think, is a specialist on him. Uh, so this is him teaching. How will the young ones learn? In the, again, in other cultures, if there was a Hakim, if there was a doctor type figure, he wouldn't teach because if he taught too many people, then he would have competitors. In the Muslim Bimaristan, you would teach. You want people to learn these skills. This, when I was uh, uh, walking around Bimaristan uh, uh, Nuri, you know, this one is a courtyard. I don't think, I don't think this is Bimaristan, this is another Bimaristan. In the courtyard, there were a lot of plants. You see these plants in the pots? I saw that. I didn't pay attention initially. But um, when I sat down, it was hot day, so I sat down next to one. And my wife said that oh, she's interested in plants. So she said, this is a very strange. The, all the plants, they have medical names. And I said, what? And then I started looking and I realized this is not plants for decoration. These are medicinal plants. You know, like digoxin, it comes from a plant, right? So many things that come from plants. They were growing plants in their in their courtyard. It made the, the whole area, it made it look beautiful, but it was also used to treat the patients. So it was like a pharmacy and a courtyard, a garden in one. And for some things, they had them ready-made. Ready-made drugs, so that if you need an emergency, they can give it. And they can, uh, um, and this was something that it was very new. Not only that, Bimaristans were teaching hospitals, right? I taught, you know, they had people going around, students going around, but they did something more interesting than this. Something, uh, it was shocking to me. And to this day, it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen in any hospital. And we should, we should start this up again. I be, believe me, this is something from our history we can replicate today. They used to teach the public. They used to teach the public. This is real public health. Not like today. Uh, salam alaikum. Uh, not even salam alaikum. They just, uh, hello, this is nine o'clock news. Please take the COVID vaccine. Trust us. We never saw you. We don't know who you are. You sh we should trust you. Yes, because I am professor so-and-so. Look at my name. Look at the, look at the title. Uh, this is a very important. You must take the vaccine uh, and you must stop smoking. Nobody's listening to this person. In the Bimaristan, they would do educational classes for the public as well. Because they understood, hey, if we don't teach the public, the public will do unhealthy habits and they will be in our door every day. And the, the volume will be too high. We need to educate them so they can educate each other so that they can look after their health as well. We are going to be partners not just telling them what to do. 
Then they made this mobile bimaristan. This was so cool. Mobile bimaristan because some people, they were too sick to come to the hospital. So you would have, the doctor would go to them, like an ambulance, right? But according to all the books, it will say ambulance was developed in the Napoleonic Wars. It was developed by a French doctor. Muslims, Muslims didn't do anything. Of course, we did nothing. No Ibn Nafis, no Ibn Sina, no Ibn Rush, nothing. We are zero. Everything everyone else did. This is if you if you let if we don't uh, tell our history, somebody else will, and they will make their own history up. So we we did this, and you know what? It wasn't just for those people who were too sick to come to the hospital. The the mobile bimaristan was also for those people who were too rich. If you are super rich, you know you live in a huge palace. Maybe you're the Khalifa. You're not going to come and be an inpatient in the hospital. So sometimes they will go to them, and those people would pay extra to fund the Bimaristan. Okay, I'm coming towards the end. Mental health. Mental health. Nobody, nobody treated mental health like the Muslims until we did. Yes, you can use one or two examples. They did this and that, but usually zero. The mentally ill, they were possessed. They were cursed. They were removed like the lepers, you know, remove them, lock them. Even to this day in some in some far eastern places, you will see a story, you know, like uh, someone is uh, mentally ill, they will put them in, a, lock them in the house for the rest of his life, for his whole life until he dies. Um, and Muslims were not like this. They came to the Bimaristan, they were given good food, they were given good clothes, they were, they didn't have antidepressants. But what did they have? They had a way of looking after people. They had these beautiful gardens. They had people, you know, sometimes playing the music in the gardens. They had peacocks roaming in the garden. Good food. You know, even if you are depressed, if you are put into a palace with the excellent food and uh, a beautiful garden and your own clothes and given money, I may, you know, probably it will have a big impact on your depression. What do we do today? I'm depressed because I don't have a job. I can't pay for my children's education. I can't pay for the health. Oh, okay, here are some antidepressants. We don't treat the structural issues. We don't treat them, right? We don't deal with the structural problems. We, here, take the drug. Now go. Maybe take some counseling and drug. Now go. The problem in society is still there. Divorce rate is still all-time high. Problem, and then we, we, but we just, we're being reactive. They were different. And you know, subhanAllah, there's a story of a, in the Bimaristan that they didn't, they would keep the um, people with mental health illnesses slightly separate, but not so separate. There was a very good story, a famous doctor in uh, Baghdad, I believe he, it was, he was treating um, a, a young boy and it, his mother was there and the young boy and he was uh, examining and he was going to give the boy some medicine. And then one of the mentally ill patients who was um, a bit further away in the corridor, he just said, you are a terrible doctor. Can you imagine, you know, one of your patients saying that? So the, the doctor got angry. He goes, why? Why did you say that? And he said, you know, he said, you're mentally unwell. You should not be talking. He said, no, I know I have mental health problems, but you are a bad doctor. So the doctor, look at the doctor. He said, why am I a bad doctor? And the mentally unwell patient, he said, because... You did not explain to the patient what was wrong with him. You just gave him a prescription. If you do not explain what is wrong with the patient, he will not have any faith in your prescription, nor will he know how to avoid this problem in the future. You must do a better job of explaining to your patient what is wrong and why you are giving this prescription, this cure. SubhanAllah, what did the doctor say? He said, you are right. And he changed his behavior. Today, not, our patients would not tell us this, nor would we react the same way. So I'm coming to the end, inshallah. What happens at the end? You have a patient. The patient it gets better. How do we decide it's time now the patient can go home? In the Bimaristan, the way they decided the patient was well enough to go home was he could eat one full baby chicken by himself and two loaves of bread. If the patient could finish this much food by himself, they would say, Alhamdulillah, 
you are cured by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you can go home. And the doctors and the patients would celebrate. Why? Because it was a team effort. The patient does not get better just by the medicine and the, the, the doctor is not the only one who made things happen. We work together. The patient and the doctor is a team. So they celebrate together. MashaAllah, you are better. Now they go away. Can you imagine? Today, what happens? Oh, you are, you are fine. Here is your uh, drugs. Okay. No goodbye, no salam, no kalam. You don't have a relationship. Okay? You want to come back there? You, when you look back at the experience, you think, ah, do I want to support them? Do I want to help them? No. Two, one baby chicken and two loaves of bread, mashallah. This is a, that, I think this is something definitely we should bring back. If nothing else we bring back, we bring this back. Everyone gets one baby chicken, two loaves of bread, then they are better. And we can talk more and more about the funding the funding model of the Bimaristan was surprisingly, it, it worked very well. Maybe it needs to be updated for this day and age, but the ones who could afford to pay, they would pay enough so that the ones who did not afford, could not afford to pay would, would not have to pay at all. And, um, you know, there was many stories like the Mamluk Sultans. Um, I think it was Sultan Barquq. I, I, I'll try to remember which one. Every Friday, he would go to Jama'ah prayer and after Jumu'ah prayer, he would walk around the Bimaristan to ensure that everything was being done correctly. It was so important. This wasn't just like, oh, I built a hospital, but nobody sees what's going on there, inefficiency, corruption, etc., etc. And if, if, if a patient passed away, then in the Bimaristan, they would pay for his uh, ghusl, they would pay for his kafan and his burial. Um, so there are many examples. The Tulunid um, Bimaristan in Cairo, the Bimaristan Nuri in uh, Damascus, the Sultan Qalawun Bimaristan in, in again in Cairo. Um, there are uh, quite a lot of examples. Unfortunately, um, as the Muslim world declined, so that our uh, Bimaristans and then they stopped making them, became uh, you know what we have today, which is a healthcare system that is not really functional for most of the Muslim world, can't say for all of them, is not very functional, unfortunately. I was reading a book recently about um, Hajj. And in this book, uh, we again, we should do a whole show just on this. The healthcare during Hajj was so terrible, not for one year or two years, for, for hundreds of years, was so terrible. And Tens of thousands of people would die from cholera and dysentery. It used to come from India and they would bring it to the Hajj and then it would spread from there across the world. And the only reason they, they tried to fix it was because the Europeans complained. Because some of the Hajjis, they would go back to their home country and from there they would go to Paris or London and then it would spread in Europe. So then the Europeans complained and they said, this is ridiculous. You guys need to do something about it. You know what the Muslims did? They still didn't fix it in the Hajj. They only, they only did quarantines when people left the Hajj. So they quaranteed anyone going towards Europe. But if you were going towards the Muslim world, they didn't quarantine you. And it was the, the situation was so bad that in one Hajj, out of 250,000 people, between 30 and 50,000 of them died during the Hajj. During those few days, they died of cholera and dysentery. It, the situation was so bad that the, the bodies were thrown, you know, like when they did the, the slaughtering the animals and Eid al-Adha, they were throwing the bodies in there as well. There was no chance. They were just like throwing away the bodies. It was disgusting. And you hear this, you read the stories and you think, subhanAllah, what is going on here? One, uh, you know, at that 1,200 uh, years ago, 1,300 years ago, we had Bimaristan. And then two, three hundred years ago, our situation is so bad that the Europeans had to insist that the Hajj needed to fix itself in terms of health because it was a risk for the health of the whole uh, globe. And even then we didn't want to fix it. The, it was a huge drop. And unfortunately, the drop continues till this day. The healthcare in the Muslim world is not what it, it's not something that anyone envies. And 
we need to change this. This is the point of this talk today, that this is something that's changeable. My brothers and sisters, there was, um, I, uh, I, I was on a holiday with my family to um, one of the big Muslim cities, you know, skyscrapers everywhere. This is, this is a very prosperous Muslim country, rich Muslim country, huge skyscrapers, beautiful restaurants, everything. And at the bottom of the skyscraper, there are poor people, like any country. But there was one child, you, when, you, when I saw this, this mother is sitting there with her baby, it broke my heart. This baby, his head was huge. His veins were bulging. His eyes were sunk. He had hydrocephalus, severe hydrocephalus, struggling to breathe. So we gave a little bit of money, we moved on. And my son, who was, I think, seven at the time, he turned to me and he said, why is that baby on the street? I, something inside me just snapped. And I became angry. And I said, this baby is on the street because the... Non-Muslims, they value their lives more than we value it. They, have, they can build a united healthcare system free at the point of use. If you go to UK, not one child will be dying on the street. Not just because it's a first world country. Because they built something like the National Health Service. It doesn't matter. When, the, when you go to the hospital, nobody asks you how much money you have in your pocket. Right? We have enough money in the Muslim world. From Malaysia to Morocco, we have enough money. We have enough food. We have enough doctors. <clears throat> what do we not have? We have zero unity. Zero. And because we are not united, because we, 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 we are competing and building taller buildings and bigger uh, buildings, but not and looking after our people, because we're not united, our children will die on the streets. And their children will be looked after in the hospital. This is the point, my brothers and sisters. This is the main message I want you to, to go away with. The Bimaristan was the forerunner of the modern hospital. But if we, the reason why it worked was because we worked together and we prioritized certain things. Disunity, it only treats symptoms. When we're disunited, when we have some very rich Muslim countries, some very poor Muslim countries, Muslim countries fighting other Muslim countries. You know, right now, the earthquake happened in Turkey and Syria. 13 million people affected. Hundreds of thousands are, you know, millions are homeless. Tens of thousands dead. Many are orphaned. I mean, this earthquake was so bad. I read an article. Hundreds of children have lost their name. How can you lose your name in an earthquake? Because these babies are the only surviving member of their entire family. Not only their entire family, everyone in this building and everyone on the street is dead. Nobody who knows this baby is alive today. So what name did their parents give this child? Nobody knows. Nobody. So they have to give this baby a new name. Not one. Hundreds. There is enough money in the Muslim world, isn't there? We have enough money. 13 million people, we can look after them. Building buildings, we could build them all buildings. Today, like this, we can build seven-star uh, hotels re reaching into the sky. We could do it. We could give them all food today. 20 million starving in Afghanistan, another 20 million starving in in um, in uh, Somalia, you know, and, and Yemen, we could give them food today. Just, we don't even have to make food for them. The food that we throw away is equivalent to the food that they need. So what's the difference? What's the problem? Disunity, it only treats symptoms. And we know that if you keep, you, you can never cure a disease by just treating symptoms. Unity, it builds systems. It builds systems. We don't just make, just give them some food, some medicine. What, what happens? What happens tomorrow? 
What happens day after tomorrow? What happens next year? This is not a solution. Build a system. This is what's necessary. Are we going to do it? This is our job. This is why FEMA exists, by the way. Federation of Islamic Medical Association. Because we don't want to work separately. We, tried, we have tried working separately for one century or more than one century. It's not worked. And we worked hard. And we put in effort. And many of us, they gave our whole lives. But we worked separately and it didn't work. Now we want to work together. Now we want to try something else. We want, if we're going to um, succeed, we want to succeed together. If we're going to fail, we want to fail together. We want to work together. This has to happen in every Muslim country. And if you are not part of your Islamic Medical Association, I beg you, join. And if you are, then get others to join. Because when we unite, inshallah, then we can get the barakah of unity. Then we can go, we can unlock the potential. We can go back to our own history. We can build the Bimar Islam system around the world. We have the, we have the capability, we have the talent, the skills, the power, the energy, the money, we have it all. Inshallah. Not separately, but together we do. So, let's work together, inshallah. I finish with one story. This is my favorite story. It tells you everything you need to know about Bimar Islam. And this is the difference between us and them. One little boy he came to the Bimarsa and he was sick. He was complaining of severe abdominal pain. Severe. The junior doctor saw him, couldn't work out what was going on. So called another doctor. And then they examined and they couldn't understand what was going on. So they called the third, fourth. More doctors, nobody knew what was going on with this child. Eventually they said, call the, the, the head doctor. Call the head doctor. So the head doctor came and he examined the child. And he said, okay, uh, I, I know what's wrong. Give this child, uh, uh, admit this child, give him a room and uh, give him some food and make sure that he's being looked after by the nurses uh, at least for three days minimum, okay? And they did this and the child became better. So afterwards, the doctor said, the other doctors, they, they went to the head doctor, they said, what was the diagnosis? None of us could figure it out. And you saw the boy, you did very small examination and you knew exactly and the child became better. What was the problem? He said, you know what the problem was? They said, no. He said, the, the problem was this child was an orphan. He was a yatim. I realized this because he was there. He had no father, no mother. And you know, when you're orphaned, you have no one to look after you. He was hungry. He was lonely. And he was sad. So I gave him a place to stay. I gave him some food. The nurses looked after him. And he felt happy. This is the difference between them and us. They saw the human beings, not just the diseases. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put barakah in their effort. In their, uh, and then give them hikmah. And gave them energy. And helped people through them. Inshallah, may Allah SWT make us doctors like that and build a system like that, inshallah, so that we can help our people um, reunite and build the Bimar Sassim. Jazakallah khairan. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Astaghfirullah. Tubalik. Jazakallah khair. Barakallah. Very beautiful uh, presentation, mashallah, uh, Dr. Wajid. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, definitely unity is the uh, is the password which we, we need to learn. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَعْتَصِمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا جَمِيعًا All of you. And this is why BIMA as well, we, 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 we do uh, uh, adopt the, our slogan, uh, inspire, unite, and serve. Jazakallah uh, khair, A beautiful uh, presentation. Um, great. I'm just wonder actually if there's any questions people would like to uh, ask. I can't see any. I mean, you did mention also about the uh, mental health. It's great to, to know that even in, in Aleppo, the Argon uh, uh, Hospital uh, used to be uh, receiving uh, uh, people for mental health. Unfortunately, Argon Hospital has been uh, completely bombarded uh, in uh, 2015. Um, 
And uh, as you mentioned, actually in uh, in Cairo, Kalawin Hospital, um, the during the Mamluki time, uh, it's a beautiful uh, uh, system of uh, um, almost uh, the national health service at that time. Uh, a great uh, specialized ward, great uh, uh, department, even uh, uh, system for uh, uh, administrating uh, patient. Uh, uh, filing system. Um, there is a places for uh, uh, different uh, department for the fractures, kusur, or for the hamiyat. We call it the fever for the uh, uh, eye, uh, medical, uh, surgical uh, side. Jazakallah uh, khair. Any questions? Any? You, there is a question. Asking hierarchy of the uh, doctors and the Bimar stand. Yes. If, if you, you have any questions, this. you can uh, type. There's a typing uh, place Q&A on the, yeah, you can type any questions there, inshallah. I think one of the brothers or sisters asking of the hierarchy of the uh, doctors in, in the Bimar stands, if you want to touch on this. So from what I can see, it's very similar, like, it's down to see it was down to seniority and skills is the combination so it was not just um age but generally it was down to seniority and and the skills and experience and uh, what you saw was that uh people had a system where they had maybe their private practice and they also gave time in the bimaristan so they came they supervised and they moved on from there um but I, I, this is what I know generally. I don't. I haven't gone deep into the hierarchical system there. Great. Jazakallah khair. Um, I'm. I'm sure we can probably maybe make uh, the presentation uh, available, inshallah, very very shortly. It'll be recorded. And jazakallah uh, uh, khair. I don't know if uh, Brother Muhammad, you want to add anything. Yeah, barakallahu feekum um, for uh, helping with this session and, and uh, jazakallah khair, Dr. Wajid, as always, for such insightful and um, very interesting way of presenting the information in the form of stories and so on, which is usually very, very impactful. Um, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept and make us among those who are excellent in the work that we do and that we think laterally, uh, like uh, you have today, including you know food and the other elements that we tend to neglect uh, due to system reasons or due to training reasons. Um, the only small thing that I would like to request the attendees please to look into is the tiny URL uh, link that I just sent uh, to everyone. Um, so if you can kindly complete the feedback form. Um, and if you are interested in joining the History of Islamic Medicine um, Committee um, representing your countries, then that would be fantastic. Uh, please do fill the and right at the end, just pop your details. Um, if there's any issues with uh, contacting that, you can, you're most welcome to drop me a message privately. I see there are a couple of people who have raised uh, their hands and just going through, yeah, how shall we get this video? It'll be, it's recording at the moment and inshallah will be available on the YouTube channel, um, the FEMA History of Islamic Medicine um, channel. So that's absolutely fine. Uh, I see that uh, Professor Karaman is uh, with us and he had a question earlier. Um, so actually, while I uh, sort it out with Professor Karaman, um, there's a question here as a dietitian. If you can have a look at that, please, uh, Mr. Sharif. Yeah, okay, uh, Dr. Wajid. Yeah, I can see the question. So the question, yeah, uh, questioner says, as a dietitian, uh, how can we optimize you know, because it has a huge impact on public health conditions. Um, how can we optimize the diet of the public? I think this is the one of the very interesting points that was made, which um, that I could see that um, uh, we need grassroots public health. So when the, the medicine is disconnected from the public, we keep telling the people, stop smoking. They're not listening to us, right? They, we put it on the smoking cigarette, it's killing you. They don't care. They know it's killing them, they're still taking it. You need to convince the people, not just here, but in the heart. 
And um, maybe we need to look at different ways of um, getting our message across to people, <clears throat> about of convincing people to look after their health, not just a top-down approach. Maybe we can try different ones. It's not really, I, I didn't, uh, apart from the, the, the Bimara styles, which had a public um, teaching element there, because you know people will trust their local doctor, their local clinician, their local uh, hospital. They have a relationship with them. They know that these are the people looking after them. That was the system. That's why I saw it was different. Rather than you know the sultan just sending a message, don't do this. It came from the the people inside your community. You have more trust with them, and you're more likely to listen. True, uh, Professor Hassan, if you want to uh, contribute. To yeah. Uh, I think you you. Can you hear me now? Uh, can you hear me now, brother? Barakallah. Yes, khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Brother Wajid, I would like to thank you uh, for this excellent uh, presentation. Uh, you have enlightened us uh, about the uh, construction, structure, and uh, uh, routine operation of the Bimaristan in, in our glorious past. And uh, uh, I call uh, this uh, period of time uh, as the golden age of uh, our history of Islamic medicine. Uh, as a matter of fact, we all believe that uh, it was the age of enlightenment in the Islamic history. Uh, maybe uh, 500, 700 years before the Europe, Europe's enlightenment age, but Unfortunately, uh, it is our uh, fault. We have lost this uh, enlightenment, and it is called lost enlightenment uh, for the time being. And it is our common duty to uh, to do our best uh, to come back to this uh, golden age of Islamic uh, history of Islamic medicine. And I uh, pray Allah Subhanahu wa Taala uh, to give you strength and more understanding. Uh, so that you can uh, enlighten all of us uh, in this regard furthermore. Jazakumullah khairan kathira. Jazakumullah khair, barakallah. I think we can uh, wrap it up anyway now. It's a, uh, it's a great uh, uh, event. Barakallah, jazakumullah khair, Dr. Wajid. Uh, and inshallah, we'll, we'll, we'll see you again. Barakallah. Jazakumullah khair. Thank you so much, everyone. Barakallah. Jazakumullah khair. And many thanks for everyone really uh, attending this uh, uh, webinar. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum.